Hi there, I'm just editing and before we start, I just want to say that Gamergate was really messy. A lot of bad things happened on both sides of the argument and I think the TLDR here is that a lot of people suffered. Some of those people certainly didn't help their case, but there was no justice that came from any sort of harassment. The other thing is that this is a lot of content. Almost 40 pages of script for just 2014 to 2015 alone. So this video is quite in depth. It's going to end quite abruptly. Just be aware that there's a lot more to come. What we are covering in this video is Zoe Quinn, Anita Sarkeesian, the Gamergate wiki page, and the Zoe post. In the next video, we will go into the timeline and the Game Journal Pro's mailing list, etc. And then we'll take it from there. My intention is not to create any sort of call to action in the sense of violence, but it is a call to action in the sense of learning from our pasts, knowing what does work, what doesn't work, and avoid the worst outcomes in what I fear could become something that is truly ugly. Okay, anyways, a flop off. Enjoy the video. Well, damn, I didn't know that we were making this into a trilogy, but it would appear as if 2024 is going to be marked as the genesis of what may be Gamergate 2, which is hilarious to me for a couple of reasons. But before we get into that, I think it's only natural that if you want to understand the sequel, you need to understand the first installment. Here is our problem. You cannot get a clean signal and you cannot trust your usual media sources because it was in fact the media that stood accused of being bad actors. And so there was certainly a motive for them to guide the narrative and tamper with evidence. It's really a lot like if you suspect a corrupt cop of murder, you couldn't really go and report to the police station where they work. That would be insane. Yet somehow that is exactly what happened. Okay, okay, don't get your tinfoil hats out just yet. Uh, we're getting too deep. We need to go back to ground zero and lay out some of the facts before we get into the media insanity. Depending on who you ask, you're going to get wildly different answers. And in spite of some of the accusations levied against me personally, I was not part of Gamergate. I was only broadly aware of the hashtag. I mean, my ex broached the subject of Zoe Quinn to me and how women were being held back by toxic gamers, but I'll be honest, I kind of just glossed over and went back to my game. I certainly had bigger problems in my life at that point in time, and one person across the world for me was hardly my concern. The irony of my personal situation in relation to Zoe Quinn would only become apparent much later, but the Zoe Quinn incident is what I think most people would refer to as ground zero. So what happened? Well, Zoe Tiberius Quinn worked on an independent game called Depression Quest that was officially released in 2014. This is where I have to correct the narrative. Most people falsely believe that Zoe was a solo developer, but the game was made in tandem with Patrick Lindsay and Isaac Shankler produced the game music. The fact that the public perception is this way in the first place is our first red flag, but I digress. Now to say that Depression Quest is a game at all is debatable as it's pretty much a website with text and hyperlinks. The background music is mostly sad piano, just plonking away with some jitters occasionally. So look, if you didn't have depression before, you might actually get depression from playing this game purely because it sets itself out to be as tedious and monotonous as possible and then frames that as a simulation of being depressed. And while while I cannot speak to everyone's experiences, I don't think it aptly describes depression as much as it may describe the level of effort three people may be able to muster under the effects of depression. Now, I'm no doctor, but Neither is anyone else involved in making this game, so we have a level playing field here. I think the greatest sin of Depression Quest is that it's supposed to teach you something about depression, but what it does instead is cross out any positive action you could make, and only leaves you with the bad options, which implies that a person with depression is incapable of attempting to help themselves, and I think that's disingenuous. I think depressed people do try to take positive actions to help their situation. They may not succeed, but I don't think it's from a lack of trying, and yet, I think you might get to a point where you stop trying, but this game basically says, nah, you're on rails and your choices are arbitrary. I mean, there are technically right choices that will then give you more options, but these choices are also seemingly arbitrary. Like how is leaning against a wall versus trying to blend in at a party going to lead you to the correct choice of going to therapy? So what are we really telling people that don't understand depression? Well, I think that you're telling them that a person with depression doesn't have age 
agency and that all their bad choices are solely symptoms of depression. I think this is a little disingenuous personally and I don't think that it's right that something like this exists as a guiding light for people that are struggling and in need of professional help. I mean normally I'd be like okay this is a terrible piece of media and call it a day but Depression Quest doubles down on being a resource for understanding depression and there is not a shred of evidence that a single professional in the field was consulted, not a study in sight, not a was done to verify Depression Quest as a valid resource. Anyways that's just my personal opinion, take it or leave it. So Depression Quest was available through its site as of 2013 which is where a lot of the reviews come from. Here is where we need to address two red herrings because later on we will see that the Gamergate movement proposed that the Zoe Quinn scandal was to elicit positive reviews which we know is false but the idea of eliciting positive press for higher profit or status is plausible and even doubly so so when we address our second fish. A common argument used to defend Zoe Quinn was that the game was free, which is a white lie. Depression Quest via the website is free or a pay what you want scheme. Hence the more traffic you can run through your site, the more money you can potentially generate. So yes, just slightly dishonest. However, it does get worse. If you pay, a portion of your purchase will go to charity. The Depression Quest website never stipulates the percentage that goes to charity and offers zero transparency on its earnings. Also below the link there is a message stating that if the link doesn't work you may send the money via PayPal directly to Zoe Quinn. Though I think it's a little hairy that there there is no confirmation as to whether this kind of payment also goes to charity and how does one clarify that this is a depression quest purchase or any other kind of transaction. Now whether this series of conveniently placed grift opportunities came from a place of malice or stupidity it's difficult to discern though it certainly didn't do anything to help her public perception. I will clarify though that there is evidence that at least one donation was made to iFred who were the original charity listed and this took place place more than a year after the game's original release. This timing places the donation to be likely after the major events of Gamergate, which makes it hard to tell whether there was any intention to make the donation had there not been considerable online pressure for transparency. Anyways, the official release was through Steam's Project Greenlight. For those that don't know, basically anyone could submit to be on Project Greenlight and if your game gets enough votes, then Steam greenlights your game and people will buy it. It was one of the worst ideas Steam ever had and it died in 2017. I feel bad for the people that were genuinely trying to make something but damn, it was just chaos and of course people would troll upvote the most asinine things. It was from this cesspool that Depression Quest was born. So if you were around in 2014, how many greenlit games were reviewed by major outlets? I struggle to think of one from memory but Depression Quest certainly got quite a few looks from major outlets. So how did it go? Kyle Orland, remember this name by the way, from Ars Technica wrote Wrote this review to quote what depression quest taught me about dealing with mental issues text-based choose your own adventure game a powerful look at a daily struggle i've been thinking about depression a lot in the past week or so the catalyst as you may expect was robin williams unexpected death by suicide and the subsequent reports that the famous comedian and actor suffered from severe bouts of depression that someone that seemed so outwardly successful and happy could succumb to something so dark inside of him was a chilling wake-up call for me and many others to re-examine ourselves and the people close to us." End quote. Oh, important little detail, Depression Quest was released the same day that the comedian and actor Robin Williams left us. And though it would be a little crazy to surmise that this was somehow planned, they did have the option of not releasing that day, but chose to continue because it was deemed too important. To quote Zoe Quinn from an interview, Depression Quest launches in spite of high profile suicide online threats by Polygon. To quote, the last thing I want for this game, Quinn wrote on Monday, is for the launch to seem opportunistic or like it's capitalizing on a massive tragedy like we've seen today. So again, I turn to you. I've thought through a number of possible scenarios. And I feel like I have a responsibility to release today." End quote. Intended or not, Ars Technica's review definitely made sure to capitalize on that situation. But hey, I'm just telling you what happened. You make up your own mind. Patrick Klepik from Giant Bomb said, Depression Quest isn't about winning. It's about helping you and me understand a disorder. Jennifer actually lives with depression and until Depression Quest, she hadn't found a game that spoke to her. End quote. Adam Smith from Rock Paper Shotgun said this to quote, Mostly indescribable, Depression Quest. 
end quote. Well, the reason you couldn't describe it, Adam, is because you didn't play the game. To quote, both of them tied in the knot in my stomach and made me feel a little less sure of myself. I decided that now was not the time to click begin, end quote. But he did go on to list a whole bunch of phone numbers that you can call if you're suffering from depression and claims that the game is a tool for communication, but like, how would you know? Moving on, Katie Williams from GameSpy said to quote, Depression Quest is easily accessible and available for free or a small pay what you want donation. And besides the blues ridden story, it's just a well made game overall. It's excellently written, well paced and so engaging that you might just find yourself playing again to find out what might happen if you'd accept the offer of psychological help or ask for a prescription or antidepressant. Try it out now at Depression Quest website. End quote. Well, I don't know what drugs Katie had taken to have such a positive outlook on the game's construction and writing, but I'd like some of what she is having. So we all know that Steam reviews are not perfect, but they are better than major outlets at gauging mass public opinion. So what do the Steam reviews say, bearing in mind that anything that is mixed or below is usually not a very good sign? Oh, well. That doesn't seem good, does it? This does not reflect the seemingly unanimous and solemn praise offered by the likes of Giant Bomb and Rock Paper Shotgun. Surely this is a review bombing campaign, right? I mean, after all, this was ground zero for Gamergate. Well, there are some that mention the controversy, but the majority of the negative feedback falls in one of two or both camps. It's a shoddy game that does nothing with the medium to enhance the experience, or it doesn't take the subject matter seriously enough. So what happened here? Well, the answer, the exact same thing that still happens every day. Day. I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but game reviews are corrupt by design, and the problem is, well, systemic. Part of the blame lies with you and me, the viewer. I experience this every day, even in my small hole on the internet. Positive reviews simply make more money and garner more positive outcomes on multiple levels than negative reviews. This is largely the effect of confirmation bias. There may be a percentage that are going to open a review with an open mind, but there's also a good percentage of us that are there to validate the purchases and decisions we have already made. So if your intent is to make money from your viewer base, there there is a lean to review games in the most positive light possible while not being caught out in a lie. And what is the best way to avoid being caught out in a lie? Simple. Make sure you're saying the same thing your competition is saying. This model works. I mean, logically, if a game is bad, it gets a bad score and everyone arrives at that conclusion naturally. And when a game is good, well, it's a good day because people aren't going to contest your reasoning at all. But what happens when a game comes out from a big studio and it's pretty bland, like, I don't know, Call of Duty. It's tired, it's the same game over and over, the game somehow gets smaller every time it's released. What do you do here? Well, you do whatever the big reviewers are doing. If you want to make money, slap an 8 or 9 on that bad boy and call it a day. Because honestly, it's easy to live with being called a shill when you have money, but it feels really shitty to be right and poor. So that's the part of human behavior that I believe aids in corruption. The other is on their end. Yes, we the viewer ultimately pay the wages of game journalists that write reviews, but not really in the short term. And we don't provide the material. If your income depends on game reviews or game stories, you need games to review and inside access in order to make money. And if that's your bread and butter, then relevancy is a pretty big concern. Intended or not, game reviewers have an incentive to foster positive relationships relationships with publishers and devs to ensure ongoing income and likewise good game reviews and positive press also help out the publishers and developers. It's a symbiotic relationship that simply doesn't include the actual customer and that's wrong from the start. Now I want to make an important distinction here. The existence of incentives for journalists, publishers and developers to collude or implicitly guide one another toward a unified narrative does not demolish the integrity of every game review and every piece of gaming media, but it is a problem. And it is a proven one. One of the preambles to Gamergate was the infamous GameSpot review of Kane and Lynch in 2007. Essentially, Jeff Gertzman gave Kane and Lynch a 6 out of 10, and the publisher, IDOS Interactive, leaned on GameSpot by pulling advertising from their site. The management of GameSpot fired Jeff as a result, while denying that the firing had anything to do with IDOS Interactive. Unfortunately, the non-disparagement clause that Jeff 
Jeff had signed on termination expired in March 2012. So even though the events happened in 2007, the general gaming community only really became aware of this truth one year before the first Depression Quest reviews were coming out. It's one thing to be corrupt, it's quite another to claim to be a news source or impartial and be caught in an attempt to cover up said corruption. As of this date, nothing has changed with the power dynamic between the reviewer, the publisher and the consumer. It is not really up for debate. It's still a corrupt system that incentivizes further corruption and really the only rule is please don't get caught or we will have to pretend to investigate ourselves again. Now that's not the only thing that was going on in 2012. Things were really starting to get heated because a few of us knew at the time that Anita Sarkeesian, a feminist, I'd say radical feminist, media critic and director of Feminist Frequency started her Kickstarter on tropes, woman vs video games and that first episode would drop early March 2013 titled Damsel in Distress Part 1 Tropes vs Woman in Video Games. The Kickstarter raised $158,922. The reception was less than stellar and while it garnished a lot of attention sitting at 3.4 million views as of this day, the estimated dislike ratio is 74%. The comments are turned off and I'm going to surmise that this was to contain the backlash but we'll get back to that. Now on top of all this, Anita Sarkeesian was subject to harassment and I think this was a failure of the gaming community. Unfortunately, gaming is not some monolith, it's actually just a collection of people that share a common interest. You can just as easily lump smokers as a demographic, but it doesn't suddenly make it a conscious collective that is responsible for the actions of every free-thinking person or clique within said demographic. If you want to see how dangerous guilt by association is, I suggest you watch my Taiwan Terror Cults and Video Games video as it explains the white terror in quite some detail. We're going to see this idea of treating gamers as a single entity weaponized and repeated many times before this video is anywhere near a conclusion, but yes, Anita Sarkis Keesian was subject to harassment and I think it's reasonable to assume that a large portion of these people may have done it in objection to Anita's proposed concepts. However, what is also true is that I think Anita had a habit of conflating criticism with sexism and harassment. This can be seen when Anita later spoke in a hearing with the UN where she says this. Not just what is legal and illegal, right? Harassment is uh, threats of violence, but it's also the day-to-day -day grind of you're a liar, you suck, you, you know, making all of these hate videos. This is not harassment. Exclaiming that you don't like someone on a public forum does not constitute harassment. Now it can become harassment if it is a protracted effort by an individual, but certainly not in the way it's described here. So aside from the screenshots that can be verified as genuinely disturbing, how could anyone really discern between what was harassment, criticism, or dislike? No one to this day knows, and I don't think anyone will ever know aside from Anita herself. Anita was quick to bounce back and some might say she even capitalized on the situation since it really turned her into a martyr. The truth is that Anita Sarkeesian is, or at least how she presented and acted, made her quite unlikable on multiple fronts. I apologize in advance, this is going to take a while to explain, but both Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn were, and probably still are, radical feminists. And by golly, you have to be so careful with how you approach this. So Mary Wollstonecraft is considered the founder of feminism, when she published a book in 1792 called A Vindication of the Rights of Women. She argued that women were discriminated against in terms of class and private property. I think anyone can look back and empathize with Mary's cause and what she stood for. The idea here was to create equal rights between men and women and this was first wave feminism. I would say many Western countries have achieved this particular goal. Next we had the second wave which then branched out to fight things like employment discrimination, maternity leave, access to childcare facilities, tax deductions for childcare expenses, equal and unsegregated education, equal training opportunities for poor women, and more liberal divorce laws. In context, I think we can all agree these are all good things. Well, there's a problem with that. Any feminist tells you that they are a feminist, the truth is that they are using a shorthand in the same way that a Christian is a Christian. But like, okay, are you Pentecostal? Baptist? Roman Catholic, feminism is fractured in its membership and ideals and those ideals are often strictly exclusionary and antagonistic to other schools of thought under its banner. 
This would prove to be a huge problem for second wave feminism and continues still on today in what is called fourth wave feminism by some. Namely, the first noticeable split occurred over abortion, which is still to this day a very sensitive topic and we're not going to go there. What are some other differences in feminism? Well, some schools of feminism acknowledge the idea of the female gaze and others reject it. Some acknowledge transgender identity and others very strictly abhor it. Some schools of feminism maintain that any choice a woman can make to further themselves is a feminist choice and should be celebrated as such and others decry so-called choice feminism as gaming a male system to the disadvantage of all other women, fictional or real. So there you go. Next time your friend tells you they are a feminist, you can ask them which wave and flavor they are. I dare you. The reason I went into all of this background is because I simply find it disingenuous when someone calls themselves a feminist and leaves out important information around their belief and where they stem from. Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn are or were radical feminists, and that is to say that equality of rights and legal matters between the sexes is not adequate because everything in our society and civilization is built around catering to men and setting them up to be in places of success, especially white heterosexual men. That's why you can find clips of Anita Sarkeesian saying things like this. Everything is sexist, everything is racist, everything is homophobic, and you have to point it all out. Can't speak for Zoe Quinn, but Anita has also gone on record as being against choice feminism. In layman's terms, Anita would not view OnlyFans girls as empowered, but actually harmful to other women. In fact, her view has an element of women and men self-select to be held accountable to the same sexual purity standards that she has subscribed to. I want to say this very carefully. The first reason why Anita Sarkeesian was so unlikable was not because she was a feminist or a woman, but because her fundamental view demands full compliance with her beliefs to reach a satisfactory outcome, and the only terms were hers. There was no acceptable middle ground. And I'm going to explain the sleight of hand here. Feminist Frequency, which Anita Sarkeesian started, defines feminism like this. A socio-political movement with the central goal of ending sexism and dismantling gender-based oppression. Great. Everyone agrees. I mean, I think they should ditch the name feminism at this point because it's hard for a 2024 layman to understand why a movement about gender equality and ending sexism sounds like a sexist movement. You know? It's not the 1800s anymore, but whatever, I'll take it. Now, if you look through the website, there's a ton of new terms that you have to learn that don't exist outside of feminism. So there's a bit of reading, be my guest. But here's what we're really looking for here. Feminism as a critical lens, to quote, as a comprehensive belief system with theory, goals, and ethics, feminism can and has been used as a basis for cultural criticism. End quote. I want to underline two components here, the fact that it's a belief system and not a science as to imply that it is not subject to scientific method or even reason unless it selectively wants to be. The other being the admission that critical feminism carries goals and though they are unstated here, the part that is not being said out loud is that the goal is to further feminism, all in to say that this is not an investigative tool at all, but rather one of applying a pre-existing bias. We're not done yet though, let's read on. To quote, at Feminist Frequency we develop our commentary based on intersectional feminist values primarily drawn from Bell Hooks, Ella G. Johnson, and other critical race theorists couched in late second and third wave feminist movements. End quote. Okay, we finally have our wave and flavor of feminism, sort of. So what did Bell Hooks say? Because Feminist Frequency actually later quotes her in their Five Tips for Men video. I can't show you the video, but I'm going to read the quote verbatim. To quote, Like women, men have been socialized to passively accept sexist ideology. While they need not blame themselves for accepting sexism, they must assume responsibility for eliminating it. Men are not exploited or oppressed by sexism, but there are ways in which they suffer as a result of it." End quote. This is the sleight of hand I was talking about. I've seen this in many radical feminist texts, but we're purely talking about Anita Sarkeesian and feminist frequency here. They open with the idea that you are signing up to end sexism and embrace equality. But if you are a man, you do not deserve or ever apparently need protection from sexism. Even if you hypothetically agreed that the statement is currently true, there is no caveat here for when or if its thesis to be true. 
And even so, this is demonstrably false. I've already covered this in my body image and sexualization in video games video part two, where I compared the discrimination male nurses face. The likelihood of sex-based discrimination rises when you are the minority within any group. But they're not done because you are in fact responsible for re-educating yourself in the belief system of feminist critical theory in order to not be perpetuating sexism passively. This is a lovely little guilt trip because it implies that you are doing harm, that you are unjust by default, and that you actually require the practice of this specific ideology to reclaim your innocence. It's very clever. What is the dictionary definition of sexism? Well, according to old Merriam-Webster, it is prejudice or discrimination based on sex, especially discrimination against women. So it makes special mention of women because the word itself was born in feminist movements from the 1960s, but the bare definition is prejudice or discrimination based on sex. I'd like to quote Animal Farm here to sum up my thoughts on this whole train of ideas that feminist frequency puts forward. To quote, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. End quote. I'll quickly just add here that it's possible that bell hooks may have been misrepresented in the choice of quotes that Feminist Frequency used, but these are the words that Feminist Frequency cherry-picked from her work as a foundation for how men fit into their belief system. So there isn't really a way to weasel into an argument of misunderstanding. English is English. Bell's statement and the choice to selectively use the statement to address men directly by feminist frequency is intentional. So is it any wonder, considering that most core gamers were men in 2012, and now that you understand where Anita Sarkeesian was coming from, her values and the lens with which she critiques, is it not obvious that she would upset the majority of the demographic? I'd go further. I don't think it was only obvious. I think it was also inevitable. Sadly, Feminist Frequency conveniently never had any of this information on their site in 2012. Imagine that. Another reason why Anita Sarkeesian was so unlikable was the simple grift on display. $6,000 to create five YouTube videos. And if we check the stretch goals, it was $1,500 per video. Like, you realize that you get money from views on YouTube already, right? Who needs $6,000 to make videos about something that they were probably going to make videos about anyways? Unless, of course, the money is the only reason you're making those videos. I don't think it takes a soothsayer to derive the natural conclusion many gamers came to here. Of course, it also doesn't help that when you have video evidence of contradicting statements, where in 2010, Anita Sarkeesian was filmed saying that she was not a fan of video games and had to learn about video games in order to do her work, and then in 2015, she claims that she had been playing video games most of her life since age five and that she was fond of Nintendo and games like Mario and Kirby. But again, you never had the 2015 clip back in 2012. So anyways, how were the videos? Well, hear me out. I don't think that all feminist critique is intrinsically wrong. So I think that Anita does mention some interesting pieces of history and touches on some thought-provoking talking points. However, you cannot make wild assertions like this one and expect a free-thinking human being to take them seriously unless they are, in fact, also a radical feminist. The player cannot help but treat these female bodies as things to be acted upon because they were designed, constructed, and placed in the environment for that singular purpose. Players are meant to derive a perverse pleasure from desecrating the bodies of unsuspecting virtual female characters. It's a rush streaming from a carefully concocted mix of sexual arousal connected to the act of controlling and punishing representations of female sexuality. Let me repeat the assertions. To quote, the player cannot help but treat these female bodies as things to be acted on, end quote. Demonstrably false in this example, considering that you have the option to not act on these female bodies at all. And you can also, in fact, act on male bodies or any other kind of body. So it's not like the player is forced into the role as Anita's critique implies, but it gets worse. To quote, players are meant to derive a perverse pleasure from desecrating the bodies of unsuspecting virtual female characters. It's a rush streaming from a carefully concocted mix of sexual arousal connected to the act of controlling and punishing representations of female sexuality, end quote. I present to you my UNO reverse card. No studies, no interviews, no polls, no data. So we can only assume that she is either the utmost authority on male psychology and sexuality or that Anita is speaking on her own behalf and projecting her own personal feelings onto the minds of unsuspecting real-life men. And yeah, that might sound a bit harsh, but 
but think about the directness of her statements as a point of authority. There is not a single clue from her end that she is sharing an opinion based on a belief system. The conclusions that she draws and the method used are often not exposed, demonstrably false, or simply not up for debate. Every single video had comments turned off while only the Kickstarter announcement video had comments on and completely unmoderated. So for those of you that have not uploaded a YouTube video before, the default is for YouTube to automatically moderate your comments by holding potentially harmful or unwanted comments. Even on my videos, were I to turn off the moderation, you would see some disgusting things. But as can be seen here, Anita intentionally turned off the moderation and left the comments open just up until the end of the Kickstarter funding. In other words, Anita Sarkeesian was fine with collecting the vitriol of the most radical aspects of the gamer demographic, but she was not okay with anyone that might actually challenge her assertions. To this day, Anita Sarkeesian is yet to enter a single debate or open forum of discussion on the topics covered in her videos. But don't worry gamers, no one would ever fall for such a scam, right? Wrong. You see, the best lies are always partially true. For example, some gamers are misogynists can be massaged into gamers are misogynists. Some gamers harass me can be massaged into gamers harass me. I am being harassed because my ideas require you to adopt an ultimately sexist lens can be massaged into I am being harassed because I am a woman. Let's have a look at the articles of the time. So yeah, this makes sense. Obviously the harassment was deplorable. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And it's absolutely worth writing articles about that. However, not a single one of these journalists ever asked or answered the question of why this was happening unless they felt like giving a patronizing backhand. Eric Kane later updated his article to state that there were legitimate concerns, but then doesn't talk about these concerns in a timely manner. So there was certainly an opportunity and the knowledge required for Eric to write about these possible problems, give gamers a voice and help defuse the situation, but he simply chose to do nothing about the escalating tensions. Similarly, you have Steven Totillo from Kotaku, I believe he holds a degree in journalism, giving this article which, yeah, it's a fair shout. He lists the mission statement of the Tropes Women's vs Video Games Kickstarter and points out that it doesn't seem so bad. Yeah, you're right. but. Why do the commenters in the article seem more researched than you are? How is it that they knew how to find Anita's previous work, analyze it and draw conclusions, and you can seemingly only refer to the mission statement? What is the point of a journalist that can only reiterate what is already in front of their audience? What is the point of a journalist that cannot tell me something new? That article by Kotaku, by the way, came out about a month after the Kickstarter closed. So you can't even say that they were covering recent news. So look, you can absolutely defend the existence of these articles, but you're not going to find an ounce of criticism towards Anita Sarkeesian in the larger aspects of gaming media, in spite of the acknowledgement of valid criticism by Eric Kane. And this will continue well into 2015. That is the most important and final reason why Anita Sarkeesian was so unlikable. Gaming media rejected the concerns of their core audience and instead placed someone that they really didn't know anything about on a pedestal and beyond reproach. So let's sum it up. Anita translated criticism and dislike as harassment and misogyny. Anita asserted her statements as an authority on the subject and not as an opinion based on a belief system. Anita actively discouraged open discourse on any of her platforms. Anita got ridiculous amounts of money for something that a lot of people do for free. Finally, and I think most importantly, Anita Sarkeesian enjoyed almost complete immunity from journalists in games media. By the way, in case you thought these articles were somehow only tied to Anita's particular incident. Here's a written interview by a freelance reporter working for Rock Paper Shotgun at the time Nathan Grayson in 2013. To quote Rock Paper Shotgun, you have some interesting alternate outfits for heroes, Roller Derby Nova especially caught my eye. On its own, that's totally fine, just a silly goofy thing, a one-off, but it got me thinking about how often MOBAs tend to hypersexualize female characters to a generally preposterous degree. That is to say, make it the norm, not a one-off at all. And StarCraft's own um, interesting focus choices as of late, how are you planning to approach all of that in Heroes? 
Blizzard representative. Well, I mean, some of these characters, I would argue, are already hypersexualized in a sense. I mean, Kerrigan is wearing heels, right? We're not sending a message to anybody, we're just making characters who look cool. Our sensibilities are more comic book than anything else. That's sort of where we're at. But I'll take that feedback. I think it's very fair feedback. Rock, paper, shotgun. I have to add though that comics might not be the best point of reference for this sort of thing. I mean, it's a medium that's notorious, often not in a good way, for sexing up female characters and putting them in some fairly gross situations. Blizzard representative, we're not running for president. We're not sending a message. No one should look to our game for that. Rock, paper, shotgun. But it's not even about a message. The goal is to let people have fun in an environment where they can feel awesome without being weirded out or even objectified. This is a genre about empowerment. Why shouldn't everyone feel empowered? That's what it's about at the end of the day, letting everyone feel their fair chance to feel awesome. Blizzard representative. Uh-huh. Cool. Totally. End quote, I'm gonna stop there. So this was an interview about Heroes of the Storm and you can see that the interview suddenly nosedives towards the end there. This is what we would call a loaded question, leading the subject and frankly it's an ambush. Was the question intrinsically wrong? No, but you are a hack if that's how you conduct an interview. Nathan Grayson would go on to follow up this interview with another article after not getting the answer he wanted. I'm going to share a few snippets here in regard to the response that he got in the interview. To quote, I want to tear this mentality limb from limb, leave it without even a single drop of blood to spill. I want to ruin it so thoroughly that its mere memory prompts bile to singe the back of people's throats raw. Why? Because it's hurtful, sad, and above all else cynical way to view what is, more often than not, an effort to give more people a sense of belonging, acceptance, something everybody wants more than just about anything else." End quote. May I remind you that this is about an optional skin in a MOBA game. But let's continue, he's going on to straw man the argument from the other side. To quote, They want a soapbox for their message, a mountain to stand on so those mean doodle faced boys will finally have no choice but to notice them, or those poor girls they stood up for will finally think, transaction completed, now I will praise my wonderful white knight and sleep with him. Bleep bloop. End quote. That's very interesting. Remember this one for later. So anyways, we go on to quote, but to believe that's where all or even most people fed up with gaming's boy club mentality are coming from is to view large swathes of humanity in such a bitter, cynical light that is just, just infuriating, gross, discouraging, misguided, sad, tears welling in my eyes as I type this sad. One of my greatest fears on this earth is that I might someday sink to the level of cynical jadedness. I worry about it every day." End quote. This emotionally charged drivel goes on and on and on. On a side note, Nathan makes the fundamental mistake of classifying all games as art, which is a very US West Coast thing to do, but it merely serves to prove that he was ultimately out of touch with the wider audience. He went further to overemphasize the carryover from media to our daily lives without any evidence when stronger scientific counter evidence was already present in 2010. He then conflates online harassment with his original argument, again with no evidence outside of quote unquote, my friends say so. And who were your friends in 2013, Nathan? So this is it. We're finally ready to talk about it. The spark that lit the internet on fire. Fast forward to August 16th, 2014, the Zoe post. I apologize if I get the name wrong, but Aaron Johnny releases a blog detailing the infidelity of Zoe Quinn with five different men and some pretty damning examples of emotional abuse. Now, I'm not going to show any of this or talk in too much detail, not because I feel it's unfair, but because I don't want this video to be taken down under some bogus claim of hate speech. What I will do is quote Zoe Quinn's reasoning in pleading that Erin keep the affair a secret and not tell her boss's wife that she had been cheated on. To quote, because games as a whole can lose one of its only strong voices for equality, because a woman's sexuality at all being public can sink that fucking ship. End quote. 
This is delusional. Zoe Quinn conflated the potential outrage at her infidelity and emotional abuse with this idea that it is the publicity of her sex life and her womanhood. Frankly, you can be outraged in this scenario regardless of sex because it's simply disgusting behavior for any human being. And this is true with no regard for what is and isn't between one's legs. More important, I think that as a statement of character, Zoe Quinn was more concerned with her career and social status than she was with fixing the problem and owning up to her mistakes. How brave that she must be a martyr for the message and be excused of all the consequences of her actions because if she wasn't the whole of gaming would implode in a misogynistic orgy. Incredible. Now we're just getting started, we're not actually here for the sex scandal, but what really matters is who the five guys are. Well, some are unknown, one was her boss, yada yada yada, Nathan Grayson. You remember Nathan Grayson? To quote, Transaction complete, now I will praise my wonderful white knight and sleep with him. Bzz, bleep bloop. End quote. So here we have a controversial indie developer that had three articles written about her in total by Nathan Grayson, who had recently transitioned to Kotaku. Gamers were outraged. Of course, some people focus on harassing Zoe Quinn and a lot of vitriol was based on her infidelity and poor character. But the real reason for Gamergate was the incestuous nature and relationship inside and between developers and the gaming media, especially in the wake of the sheer avoidance by gaming media to address the reasonable criticisms of figures like Anita Sarkeesian. In fact, it seemed like all of gaming journalism had adopted Anita's belief system and simply continued to echo her dogma. Now, before we go any further, I said it at the beginning, there are certain sources which you cannot trust, and the Gamergate Wikipedia page in particular is really an untouched relic of the propaganda of the time. To start off with, there is only Gamergate's, in brackets, harassment campaign. There isn't a page that discusses the more civil aspects of Gamergate and the questions of ethics and journalism. Instead, under this page near the bottom, it discusses the claim that the movement was about ethics and journalism, and then uses articles of said accused journalists and opinion pieces of sympathizers to refute the claim of corruption. This page pulls off a neat sleight of hand where they managed to mention the allegation that Zoe Quinn slept with Nathan Grayson for better reviews, which is technically verifiably false when the statement is framed in this way, but then fails to mention the Games Journal Pro mailing list, which does firmly bring into question the appropriateness of gaming journalists' relationships between each other and their sources, but we'll get to that. What's more disturbing is the use of sources. The news articles predominantly focus on the harassment of the likes of Zoe Quinn, Anita Sarkeesian, and Brianna Wu, all feminists with platforms within the gaming industry. Brianna Wu called for an FBI investigation, which resulted in two people receiving a verbal warning, which in my mind either indicates that the FBI did not take the case seriously enough, or their investigations concluded that Brianna Wu was wasting their time. The FBI documents are available for public consumption, so you can make up your own mind about that. Strangely, there is no mention of the harassment of female or trans Gamergate sympathizers, even though those interviews do exist in the sources of the page itself. I guess they weren't famous enough to have a voice or something. Anyways, opinion piece after opinion piece after opinion piece. I clicked on every single one of these. These are almost all opinion pieces that attribute Gamergate to the misogyny of white males through allegations, again, predominantly interviews with Zoe Quinn, Brianna Wu, and Anita Sarkeesian. If you aren't seeing a reoccurring theme here, I suggest you check your local optometrist. There are only two sources that claim to have verifiable data on the subject. The first is a study where we can save a lot of time if we simply read the limitations of the study. To quote, the design of this review inherently works under the assumption that there is indeed an existing relationship between right-wing extremism and video games. End quote. I cannot make this stuff up. The second is an article from Newsweek titled, Is Gamergate about media ethics or harassing women? Harassment. The data shows. So what they did is measure the hashtag Gamergate tweets directed at Anita Sarkeesian, Brianna Wu, Kotaku, Lee Alexander, there's a lot of people involved, Nathan Grayson, Stephen Totillo, and Zoe Quinn. So first thing to note is that this so-called study does not measure anything else said using the hashtag. So if there is any Gamergate discussion that is happening that doesn't directly tag one of these figures, it seemingly doesn't exist according to Newsweek. 
They go on to postulate that because the women received more tweets than the men, though the fact that Kotaku received more tweets than Lee Alexander and Zoe Quinn seems to get a pass, this somehow indicates that they were being harassed more so than men and therefore Gamergate was about harassing women. Except in the same article there is a graph that breaks down the positive, neutral and negative sentiments of the tweets directed at these people and the overall sentiment in all of them is overwhelmingly neutral. Not only was this study intellectual dishonest, but the data directly contradicts the statement in the title. Now all of this calls into question Wikipedia's policy and what it includes in sources, since it allows editorial pieces and sensationalism to be used as sources, and essentially this has proven to be a very gameable system, with Gamergate's Wikipedia page itself being probably one of the best examples of it. Additionally, as you sift through these opinion articles, you are going to see a common trend. All of them state that Gamergate is incredibly nebulous and inconsistent with its views, which is partially true, as it was a consumer revolt and anyone could identify as part of that revolt and then insert their own agenda. My counterpoint is that the writers of these articles don't have eyes. Gamergate started its own wiki where it outlines the three C's of Gamergate. Similarly, the three C's of Gamergate are echoed on r slash Kotaku in action, which is the main subreddit for Gamergate. What are the three C's? Censorship, corruption, and collusion. We can go further when we look in the Kotaku in action rules, we see that Calls to action, brigading, doxing, and harassment are all defined and banned. There is in no way any correlation between the mission statement of the consumer revolt that was Gamergate with the actions of the malicious individuals that claimed to act in its name. This is a level of grace in the court of public opinion that seems to be afforded to anyone harassing figures that are sympathetic to the Gamergate movement, but the same grace is not afforded when harassers claimed to be part of Gamergate. This is a classic case of guilty by association without any effort to verify. Okay, I'm editing this video right now and we need to stop here for today. Gamergate was a very messy situation and the nature of what was happening makes it very difficult to unpack. To give you an idea, we are only halfway through the events of Gamergate. We haven't even gotten to current events yet. So thank you for your patience. I hope you learned something. Let me know what you think down in the comments and we'll talk again real soon.